Hi, I'm Dr. Jerry Henwood, a retired literacy specialist from Laura Marion High School. And today I have the pleasure of conducting an interview with Lindy Lee. Hi, Lindy, welcome. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, Lindy just completed a run for a congressional seat. And although she uh, did not win the election, uh, she has a lot to share with us today, and that's why we've invited her in. Lindy, could you tell me, how did you become interested in running for political office? I've always wanted to serve our country in whatever capacity I could. I'm a first-generation American. Being American is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. Um, English is my second language. I'm incredibly grateful to be here and to live in this country. My family and I came here with very little, just a few dollars but we created something amazing out of it through determination and hard work. And that is the essence of the American dream. And I want to make it available to anyone. What were some of the uh, principles that you were running on, on your platform? This is, may, might sound a little bit esoteric, but I really believe that there's too much money in politics. And until we clean up the rot, we're not going to get anything else done. For example, I want to do something about gun violence, but I can't because the NRA is in the way. And I want to do something about climate change, but I can't because ExxonMobil is in the way. For every single thing that we care about, there's a special interest that's blocking progress. So campaign finance reform is a must. And that means having a legislative fix for Citizens United and um, having greater transparency so we know who's paying for the TV ads we see on TV. But other things like economic opportunity, pay equity, equal pay for equal work. Why are women still being paid 78 cents on the dollar in the year 2018? It's so backwards. I, I think we're just as intelligent as our male counterparts. Um, I'm in favor of $15 minimum wage. If you adjust for inflation, wages haven't grown since the 1970s. But corporate profits have soared. CEOs now make 300, 300 to 500 times more than the average worker which is astounding. It's like the second Gilded Age. Yes, I agree. Yeah, I can go on, and you, you worked in Laura Mirren. You're the expert in this arena. You understand the importance of public age education. Oh, absolutely. And one of the things when you mentioned money, uh, and it's, it, I found a little bit daunting uh, whenever I watch the news and hear about some of the issues that you've been raising, uh, how do you, uh, an average citizen, how do you go about raising the money to run and challenging these these lobbies? It's so hard. I sell. I um, I sold my four hundred one k to fund it. It it's enormous amount of money. Half a million dollars is not enough, and that's about as much as I spent. Um, there were two super PACs in the race, and. Um, it's just hard. I mean, you're just up against millions of dollars. I mean, you have to get your message out. And I told you, I mentioned earlier about mailings. Mailings are expensive going on TV and hiring the staff and the yard signs and the t-shirts. I mean, all of this adds up. Um, it's just, uh, it's very hard for someone without means to run for Congress. As you planned your campaign, and you're somewhat of a novice. Uh, have you held I'll be any political? Admit that. <laughs> yes, and and uh, so it's very important to get your foot in the door. Uh, do you have any plans to, uh, since your goal was such an ambitious one of winning a seat in Congress in the House of Representatives, right? Uh, have you thought about? Maybe running, for a local office? running either for local and then state and then finally federal office? Well, the reason why I'm running is gun violence. Sandy Hook, um, 20 children and six teachers were killed at Sandy Hook on December 14, 2012, which is also my birthday, and I just remember being eternally scarred by that. And I, we cannot have a patchwork of state legislation. We need a federal comprehensive solution so we, can, we don't have a shooting every week or shooting every we have massacres every day that aren't even mentioned these things can only be addressed at the federal level and we need people under the age of 35 in congress we're the ones shouldering the debt we've mortgaged our future we deserve a seat at the decision making table because we are the ones footing the bill ultimately and what about college affordability i just came well it's been actually longer than 
I am aging, but <laughs> <laughs> I know what it's like to have to work your way through school. My first job was $9 an hour at Wawa. And uh, we gotta make it easier for students to get an education. You're from education, you know how expensive it can be. It's fifty to $60,000 a year. No one should go bankrupt going into college. You know, I, I also have trouble understanding why Wall Street enjoys better interest rates than our students. Why are they, why do they have access to better, better terms? And why are we sitting on $1.5 trillion of student loan debt? These are federal issues that cannot be solved at the state level. And I just, I care deeply. If I'm gonna do something about it, I gotta care deeply about it. And these are the issues that resonate with me. And I've seen the suffering, I've suffered firsthand. And I wanna bring those experiences to the table. When you speak about you've suffered some of these things firsthand, could you tell us a little bit about your personal background? Sure. Again, um, my family and I came here with nothing and it's truly I'm the granddaughter of illiterate rice farmers so it's actually truly remarkable that we made it this far and it's only it's a testament to the enduring strength of the American dream it's a testament to how amazing this country is because only America only in America can someone like me who came from nothing run for Congress it's astounding we've got to keep that dream alive so it's not so rare anymore and just so that the viewers know you uh achieved the American dream by going to an Ivy League school. Uh, you, you attended Princeton University. I'm still surprised they accepted me, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so blessed that they did. It changed my life. And that was actually the beginning of my political. Um, so I, I actually went to school down the street at Agnes Irwin School. And I spent most of my time there in the library. It was actually a designated Lindy table that no one else sat at. I just, I studied all the time. And when I um, went to Princeton, I just remember standing under the cherry blossom trees, right? Um, I still remember. And being on the phone with a friend and saying that I just can't make the same mistake that I did at Agnes Irwin. I have to do something to distinguish myself. I have to make friends. I have to care about people. It's gotta be more than books. So I ran for class president at age 17 exactly a decade ago and uh, no one thought I could win. I was up against a field of like 10 guys and um, made it to the runoff and some, somehow I won. I knocked on 1,000 doors giving out candy. <laughs> so the stakes are very high. But um, I became the first woman to be elected four times in a row and that gave me the confidence to just keep at it in public service. You know, every step of the way they said, I said I couldn't do it. Every step of the way. You know who you remind me of? I just saw uh, the movie, uh, Ruth Boehner oh, Ginsburg, RBG. RBG. Yeah. And uh, she told a similar story about being one of seven in law school at Cornell in the 50s, uh, one of seven women, and there were like over 500 males. So uh, you sound very much like her. And as passionate as she uh, is and was about uh, gender discrimination and other issues. Nice thing to say, to even be in the same sentence as her. You know, I used to tell people that RBG had cancer twice yeah. and showed up to the bench every single day. You can show up to vote. Yes. You know, just no excuses. And she's a remarkable woman. And I remember being so enchanted by the love story um, that she shared with her husband. They met at Cornell. And I remember a quote, he died a number of years ago, but he used to say that he loved watching her scale the judicial uh, mountain, so to speak, and just watching her career soar. Mm -hmm. To have a man like that by her side is just, it's, it's amazing. Absolutely. And in the same way that you mentioned the personal sacrifices you've made, selling your 401k to help finance. Did you know there's a 10% penalty if you're under 65? I did no. not know that. Yeah, so. Because I am not on the brink of retirement. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and the 401k is supposed to be for retirees. Got it. But anyway, we needed the money. Yeah. So, and yeah. I, I have no regrets. I definitely learned a lot. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. But I want to do this somewhat chronologically, so oh, I sorry. cover yeah, all my yeah. points. That's okay. Uh, now, once you graduated Princeton, what, what did you do then? I worked about like 30 minutes from here at Merck. 
I worked with the chief financial officer, and it was dur definitely during a pivotal time because it was a rollout of the Affordable Care Act. So I saw firsthand the ramifications of that, and I got firsthand experience working with Medicare and Medicaid, and um, just uh, realizing that healthcare is 18% of our GDP, but we have very little to show for it. We're first class nation, we're third class healthcare. And our healthcare costs are so high, and deductibles are so high, it's like not having any health insurance at all. And so my experience there definitely um, piqued my interest in healthcare and drove my determination to do something about this, to, to reduce costs and to make sure that people are not paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for the medicine that they need. Just as you shouldn't be go going bankrupt, going to college, you shouldn't go bankrupt because you're sick. Mm -hmm. And uh, I... Um, it's kind of a bold thing to say, especially even in the Democratic Party, but I'm in favor of Medicare for all because I believe that health care is a basic human right, not a privilege for the wealthy few. And being a woman should not be considered a pre-existing condition. You and I pay more for health insurance because of our gender. And that doesn't seem fair. I just don't know why women should be charged more. Yeah, well, there are a lot of ways that we're charged more in society, but... Um, Charge more and sure changed. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Very, very interesting. Now, um, you did tell us already why you decided to run for office. You didn't win, and you told us the price of uh, conducting an election and how hefty it is. Uh, evidently, you feel so strongly about this, and the issues you raise are very valid ones, and you speak with such passion that you're willing to begin saving to run again. Now, does that mean that in two years uh, you'll run again? When does it mean you'll run again? I don't know. I'm not clamoring to run again. It, um, I just know that I will. It's got to be, I right now I'm trying to gain the wisdom and the experience to be a better person and public servant going forward. I. It's just got to be a right time. I'm not... No, I'm not carpet bagging around looking for a seat. It's just got to be right. It's got to be, it's got to be my home district. But we're getting a new map. That's another thing. Every ten years, we're approaching another ten-year increment. So I don't even know what the districts are going to look like. I just know that I'm from. I have roots in Delaware County in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. That's just where I'm from, and my parents live in Montgomery County. Right. Right. Um, but you know, I. I, I will definitely remain in the arena. I serve as a woman's chair at the Democratic National Committee now, as well as a Mid-Atlantic Regional Chair, so I'm very involved in politics. Um, I have great ties with, I've, I was endorsed by 20 members of Congress, which is way more than anybody, any other candidate received. Did that get out there, by the way, the endorsements? On my social media and everything, I asked the inquiry to report it, but they just didn't. Yeah, they even wrote a really lengthy article on me, but admitted that fact. I, I love you, Holly, but I don't know why you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually even texted her. You know, I was in. This is a huge deal. You know, you know I was endorsed by the vice chair of the Democratic National, uh, the, sorry, De Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, and also the vice chair of the Democratic National Committee. And other than through my email list and social media, um, the inquiry. I think. You know, media, they have a narrative, and it's, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what kinds of things have you learned from running? That the team is so important, and um, you just got to find trustworthy, competent, hardworking people. It's really hard. It's really hard, and... Um, you know, I'm just thinking, sometimes I think to myself, is every field so hard as this one? But I just, I think politics is being unique in, in the lack of trustworthy. I, I don't mean to say this, but it's just, I've been burnt and hurt so many times that it makes it very hard for me to trust people again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And especially just imagine that, just think about the massive amounts of money that are involved and everybody wants to get a piece of it. Um... Even after the election, I still have people banging on the door asking for money. It's just astounding. Wow. Well, what did you do uh, to, for instance, it does take money to run for an office, and people contribute to the candidates that they'd like to see in office. Uh, did you do anything specifically 
uh, to garner not only votes, uh, but financial support? Yeah, I, throughout my, uh, throughout the past two years, I raised about $700,000. And uh, that's actually you know, why the media did start paying attention, just because for them, money is a signal of viability. Mm -hmm. And to a certain extent, that is true. And uh, I have a nationwide donor network um, comprised of people who believe in my vision of America. They want to invest in it, of um, equal opportunity, and um, just being a voice for the voiceless, um, for the youth, for women, for Asian Americans. For Chinese Americans, I want to show America that immigrants love this country just as much as everybody else. And we're not here to take anything, we're here to contribute. We're here to make America better and to create jobs and opportunities for other people. And um, I guess in that regard, I'm a pioneer because America hasn't really seen anything like me before. All right. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're right, uh, except for maybe uh, RBG. <laughs> Oh, again, yeah, I should not be in the same sentence as her, and she is just, she's a, a human being of another order. Yeah. And actually inspires me, because even, I think she's 80-something now, and she still goes to the gym. Yeah. And um, it's just amazing. Yeah. Definitely. Well, you know, uh, just to give you some encouragement, uh, there was an, a swelling of females who were elected, and uh, some people are saying that this is the year of the female. Uh, people moving into Congress, and uh, it's very encouraging for women. And you're you're still very young, and I hope you don't lose your passion Never. as you get older. I've been like this all my life. Uh huh. It's just it's in my bones. I'm supposed to do this, just like, you know, you love somebody. Um, I just know that this is a path for me, and it just believe it or not, even though I may not have won um, this time. Remarkable things did happen. You know, I have 18,000 followers on Facebook that I have. It's like communion with them. And just, they're all across Delaware County and Philadelphia, and they tell me their stories, and um, I become a vessel for their hopes, and it's just remarkable. And we did really well in Philadelphia. Um, and, I, I, you know, a lot of people lost their first races, like Clinton, Obama, I mean, Lincoln, I, I again, I, I can never be present anyway being an immigrant, but, and I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm anything like these amazing people, but um, it's hard winning your first time. You just mentioned something, being an immigrant. You're a naturalized citizen? Yes. Yes, because um, I, I didn't know that you had been born elsewhere, and I thought you were born here. So you're closer to the presidency than I will ever be. I see. Okay. <laughs> you could run for president, but I could not. If I'm ever honored um, to serve in Congress, I'd be happy to be there for as long as I'm useful. I'm not trying to scale the heights. Yeah. I'm just trying to get things done. And and if we do something about gun violence, maybe I can finally go on vacation. I've never been on vacation. Maybe I need to go away. <laughs> but, I, I have a daughter-in-law in Los Angeles who started oh, wow. a satellite group of Moms Against Gun Violence. Good for her. So, uh, and, and her daughter, a twin of a boy and a girl set, uh, talks about becoming a, a leader. And oh, she, she's seven. Oh, and even goodness. now she talks about becoming a leader. Oh, that's wonderful. So uh, she has a good role model in a mother and other role models in her life. And uh, who knows, she may be where you are now uh, in another 20 years, because she'll be 27. Oh my goodness, that's fantastic. So. And uh, if she's a Democrat, she'll have an easy time in California. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I do have some other follow-up questions for you. And that is, now that the election is over, are you gainfully employed? Or are, are you looking for work now? Well, I'm in cancer research now, but I am also open to other opportunities. A number of firms have come to me and um, actually interested in broadcast journalism and just uh, highlighting the issues that I care about, that we care about, and that I think are important. For example, the opioid epidemic that is ravaging both city and suburb. You know, these are some of the biggest issues that are facing our country today. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to have someone young, female, and Asian American just talking about it. Right. And uh, 
you know, I just, it's really sad. You know, we had 17% voter participation this time around. And a lot of that is on our generation. It's on the millennials. We're not stepping up. And I want to galvanize my generation to care and to realize that they have no right to complain. They have no right to complain about Trump if they didn't show up at the polls. And I'm, I'm not saying, and not to be really partisan over here, but, you know, they have, they have no right to complain about Nancy Pelosi if they don't cast a ballot. They have to show up. Absolutely. And I'm not going to be nice about it to my own you know, peers. They have to just take a few minutes out of their day to exercise their sacred right to vote. There are people who have died to make this possible. I come from a country where you can't go on Facebook, you can't read the failing New York Times, you can't do these things, you can't vote. That's out of the question. And then to see in America, a lot of our fellow countrymen just don't even care. You know, at the slightest inconvenience, they don't even show up. Mm -hmm. When people halfway around the world would die for the opportunity to have a mark on the leaders that govern their country. Absolutely. Whether it's, we tend to have lower voter turnout when it rains, when it rains, for heaven's sake. Remember the rainstorm last week? Yes. I was really bummed about that. Yeah. Because um, being a minority, that drove the minority vote. I mean, that just Mm -hmm. just plummeted. Mm -hmm. Well, you're too young to remember this, but you're really conducting what in the 70s had been called grassroots movements. And my husband, we lived in uh, University City at the time, was a Democratic committee man. And uh, it was all about knocking on doors, getting out the message, talking, both Republican and Democrat, being able to civilly talk and uh, about their differences in issues. And the times have really changed. But uh, given what you've shared with us today, Uh, You really are part of a resurgent grassroots effort movement, I think, in this country. And um, I wish you uh, success in the future. And I hope that there are more young people like you who come out and stand up against the lobbyists and uh, the uh, privileged money groups that seem to be controlling more and more our democratic system. Oh, absolutely. They've got a stranglehold on it, I'm telling you. There's stories that I don't even, just the, um, it's just uh, almost the, you know, the verbal insults. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's a lot, you know, sometimes I'm even surprised, I'm surprised at how strong I am. But then I realize it's because I so deeply believe in the mission. That's my armor. It's kind of like my... I don't know if you're a Harry Potter fan, but it's like my invisibility cloak. It's just my extra aura of strength because I so deeply believe in our democracy. You know, a lot of people are down in America. We complain about our country, but I'm still bullish. You know, I, I'd i go long on America. <laughs> and <laughs> it's just, um, just deeply invested. And that's why I'm able to pick myself up again despite setbacks. And I... It's almost like a refiner's fire. It's purifying me. Right. Yes, good. Well, uh, today I want to thank Lindy Lee for coming and sharing her experiences, her uh, newfound knowledge with us, her passion for politics. And I hope it inspires many of you to participate, especially uh, if that has lagged recently. So thanks again.